So I work in the field of artificial intelligence, AI, and I want to talk to you not so much about my own work, but some of the things that have captured my imagination. One of the things that captured my imagination in the 70s when I was here in Hunter was the idea of a self-cleaning house. I thought that would be way cool that a house had the technology to take care of me. And OK. And then I, oh, but I'll talk about that in a minute or two. First, I want to talk about the fact that artificial intelligence is very much part of our lives. We saw that in the video. Um, we see other examples. None of those examples really make my socks go up and down. These at least are more technically interesting. There are cars advertised on television these days that help you drive, that watch your blind spots. There are cars that drive themselves. Google has several. They have to have a driver in the front seat, not in the driver's seat, to, for California law. The military has cars that drive themselves. There are rescue bots that look for people in avalanches. There are rescue bots that the military have, and of course the military has bots that kill. That's been recently almost admitted. That does not make my socks go up and down. Um, I want to know what can be done that really will help our lives be better. Uh, some of the things that really grab my imagination are the ways in which we can automate tasks I don't want to do, like vacuuming, as we saw earlier, or self-cleaning houses. So in the 1970s, I was hearing about a self-cleaning house. In 1980, Francis Gabe had a patent for one. It just wasn't what I wanted. It had a sprinkler system. It had a drain. <laughs> not going to do it in my house with all that water. Oh, um, not very pretty either. So I want to think about how we could use artificial intelligence to build a better kitchen. A lot of people are talking about putting appliances on a smart grid which reasons about when electricity demands are high, when power is available, for instance, if it's windy and you've got windmills. G talked about putting cameras in a refrigerator so that the cameras could see when you were running low on things and call a delivery service and have it delivered, presumably while you're at home. And they had the idea of a networked oven, which you could call on your cell phone and say, I'm coming home, start heating up. Another company, I don't remember who, had a kitchen that could talk you through recipes. Had the recipe, it had cameras that could watch what you were doing, it had a scale under the counter so that it could see how much of the ingredient you had put down and could advise you, oh, wow, maybe you'd better add some more milk. Um, but what about a kitchen that suggests recipes based on its knowledge of your mood and what you like when you're in that mood? <laughs> Anybody weirded out hearing that? <laughs> um, so kitchen could not only get that phone call from you, I'm leaving the office, it can know where you are because you've got a cell phone that's got GPS or something like it. It could be aware of traffic or the subway system so it can know when you're likely to get home. Mood aware. So how would it know what mood you're in? Maybe if at work you've got a camera, probably on your computer there's a camera. It's watching your face. And Paul Ekman, he's the model for that TV show Lie to Me, he worked with computer scientists to teach us to teach the computers how to recognize emotional reactions on faces. Yeah. Well, it turns out, no, it gets better. It turns out, according to one of my colleagues, that the better way to recognize emotional reactions, is, or cheaper anyway, is just to put sensors on your chair. Some... <laughs> Any of you clenching yet? Nervous? <laughs> right. So it knows what mood you're in, your kitchen does. It knows what preferences you have. It knows where you are and when to start heating the oven. We can expand from the kitchen to the whole house. There are projects all over the world building houses mostly for people with impairments at this point. The elderly people with dementia, PTSD, physical handicaps. These are, this is just a random sampling of ones I know about. Um, the house can react to your emotional state. This was an article in the New Yorker two years ago about Professor Matarazzi. 
Mataric and her robots that help people with their physical therapy. And the robots can say, you're doing a very good job, let's do some more. Or they can say, okay, come on, do it. <laughs> and whether one approach works better or the other can even vary over time. So she's programming her robots to recognize when one approach or the other works better, to recognize your emotional state. This leads us into the notion of affective computing, computing that recognizes your emotions and can portray emotions in robot faces, body language, in avatars on the screen, and can make decisions based on these emotional reactions. My students ask me, can robots really feel? Personally, don't know, don't care. What I do know is they can be made to act as if they had feelings. Um, my title mentions socks. So what can Granny's socks do? They can certainly be wired to track her blood pressure and her heart rate. And if her ankles swelled up, they would massage the ankles. Yes, I know it says that twice. I really want those socks. <laughs> um, you can put all sorts of hardware into a pair of socks. You could put a GPS device that can tell where Granny is in the house, whether she's gone out, where she's going. If she seems to be wandering aimlessly rather than going to her usual supermarket, whether she's going in circles. You can put an accelerometer in her socks. That's the kind of thing you have in your cell phone that tells you if it's this way or that, so you know whether her ankles are this way or that, and whether they suddenly went that way in the middle of Times Square. And you want a communication device so that it calls and tells somebody if she's fallen. You can put Mon um, sensors on the bottoms of the socks to monitor her gait, see if her hips are hurting, how her knees are doing, or her ankles. Um, yeah, there's all that massage. I, I was told I had to mention my own work. Um, some of what I do is planning under uncertainty, planning when you don't know the outcome of the actions you're going to take, but maybe you have probabilities over possible outcomes. I'm also working on medical decision support for patients deciding about treatment, doctors recognizing the need for treatment. Coming back to the house, I love the idea of a house taking care of someone. This is from Diana Cook at Washington State. That's not Diane Cook. That's one of the subjects in one of her studies. Her project, CASA, watches out for the people in the house. But in any sort of technology, things can go wrong. You're probably familiar with Clippy. The guy who, that's the paper clip from Microsoft Systems. The guy who developed that says that's not what he developed. That's what they implemented. But one of my favorite bad designs was the anti-rape bra. <laughs> Wait, it gets better. So this bra has a heart rate monitor. It has a GPS device, or it was going to. It was announced in a 2000 lingerie show. I don't know if they ever manufactured it. And it had a communication device, and it monitored your heart rate. And if it accelerated suddenly, obviously you were in trouble. So there you are at your high school reunion, and <gasps> woo, woo! <laughs> Not really practical. <laughs> so I want to make a pitch for activism for design for artificial intelligence. I want to encourage you to bring your ideas, bring your creativity, bring your political awareness, bring your programming ability, your ability to design, and most of all, bring your common sense to the development table. Thank you. <laughs>